Hello and welcome to today's session where we'll be taking a look at the poem Before You Are Mine by Carol Ann Duffy. This is one of the poems in the Love and Relationships collection of the AQA Poetry Anthology. Before we take a closer look at the poem together, it's important we consider some of the context surrounding Carol Ann Duffy and her work. Duffy was born in 1955 in a very poor, impoverished part of Glasgow called Gorbals, and not a very pleasant place to, to grow up. And although she moved to Stafford in England aged six years old, Glasgow still features in this poem, as does a reference to Catholic Mass. So it's worth considering that her parents were descended from Irish Roman Catholics and they raised Carol Ann Duffy as a Roman Catholic too. And these details have led some to believe that the poem is, if you like, an autobiographical poem about Duffy's own mother. Duffy has been a poetry critic, a professor of poetry, professor of creative writing, and most recently, the Poet Laureate between 2009 and 2019. That's the person appointed by the Queen to write poetry about important national events. Um, and she's been succeeded by Simon Armitage. Her poetry explores a wide range of topics, but one common thread that runs through them is this focus on the everyday lives of ordinary people, and particularly lives that are undergoing some kind of change, whether that's changing relationships, the changing nature of love, um, but she also explores other topics too, things like memory and even language itself. But one thing that characterises much of her work is this focus on women and feminist themes, and so the lived experiences of women, what it means to be a woman. And you find that in a number of her different pieces of, of poetry, um, collections such as the Feminist Gospels and Rapture, two of my particular favourites in her work. Most recently, though, she's branched out into things like children's poetry um, she's been the editor for various collected volumes of poetry, and she's even taken to writing children's stories too. But obviously we're going to be focusing uh, on Before You Are Mine. That's worth pointing out that there's no actual reference to the gender of the speaker in the poem, but most critics have interpreted it as a daughter talking about her feelings about her mother. And some have gone a uh, stage further and have mentioned the autobiographical references to things like George Square, and mass that Roman Catholic practice as being an indicator that this is really um, Duffy talking about her own um, experiences, her own mother. But we must accept that there is still the possibility that the speaker in the poem is a constructed persona. So you could argue that it's a son talking about his mum, although I tend to agree with the critics that it feels more like a daughter talking about her mother. So we should consider the idea that this is most likely an autobiographical poem, and that the person speaking in the poem is an imagined version of Duffy as a younger woman talking about her feelings about her mother when her mother was a young woman. Now, when we talk about context, it's really important that you don't just roll out some random factoids about Carol Ann Duffy and drop them into your paragraphs in the hope that that's going to get you marks for AO3. It might get you some, but it will most likely come across as quite clunky and quite heavy handed, and it'll probably interrupt the flow of your ideas and your argument. Instead, what you should be doing is trying to think about how you can say something relevant and meaningful about the period of time being represented in the poem and how the ideas in the poem reflect the time period that it's set in. Now, if we do go with the dominant view that the poem is Duffy talking about her own mother, that would mean that the young mother growing up in the poem is living through the 1950s. And this is a really interesting time period. On the one hand, women were expected to conform to very traditional roles. So you'd be the obedient daughter and eventually you'd grow up, get married and become a dutiful wife. And women, of course, at that time were expected to have children of their own and be caring mothers. So they had all of these kind of very rigid um, expectations that were largely set by a very patriarchal culture. That is to say, a society ruled by men. And so as a result, there were very limited freedoms for women. But something really interesting happened during the 50s. In the 1950s, in places like America, and then of course it rolled out around the world, we saw something called the birth of the teenager, when all that means is, if you like, the rise of youth culture. For the first time, there was a sense that young people's lives were very different, markedly different from the lives that their parents led. And so we start to see this kind of schism, this gap between what children were doing and teenagers were doing and what their parents were expecting of them. So this meant that the 1950s were a period of profound change, and we see some of those ideas reflected in the poem, particularly around this challenge to traditional conservative views of 
women and how they should live their lives. Let's take a look at the poem itself. I'm ten years away from the corner you laugh on with your pals, Maggie McGinney and Jean Duff. The three of you bend from the waist, holding each other or your knees, and shriek at the pavement. Your polka dot dress blows round your legs. Marilyn. I'm not here yet. The thought of me doesn't occur in the ballroom with a thousand eyes, the fizzy movie tomorrows the right walk home could bring. I knew you would dance like that. Before you are mine, your ma stands at the close with a hiding for the late one. You reckon it's worth it. The decade ahead of my loud, possessive yell was the best one, eh? I remember my hands in those high-heeled red shoes. Relics. And now your ghost clatters toward me over George Square till I see you, clear as scent, under the tree, with its lights and who small bites on your neck, sweetheart? Cha-cha-cha! You teach me the steps and the way home from mass, stamping stars from the wrong pavement. Even then, I wanted the bold girl winking in Portobello, somewhere in Scotland, before I was born. That glamorous love laughs where you sparkle and waltz and laugh before you were mine. Let's just take a moment to reflect on the story of the poem. So it begins with a daughter looking at a photograph of her mother at a much younger age when her mum was still a young adult. And in the photograph we see her mum with her friends Maggie McGinney and Jean Duff. And it looks like they're going out for an evening together. Um, her mum's wearing a polka dot dress. So the girls are all dressed up. And in this photograph they're bending over from the waist and laughing, shrieking, so full of joy and excitement, perhaps uh, being together as a group of friends or perhaps because they're excited about their night out. And the daughter takes a moment to reflect on just how pretty her mother was at that age. And it makes a pause and think, wow, she's as pretty as Marilyn Monroe, the famous movie actress. So we sense that the daughter is sort of in awe of her mum at that age. And then that photograph of her starts to make the daughter imagine what was mum's life like when she was a young woman. And so we get some references to things like ballrooms, so these kind of dance halls where she imagines her mum going out with her friends to go dancing. She imagines the kind of the hope and optimism her mother must have felt at that age. And you also get a bit of reflection on the fact that her mum was probably quite a rebellious teenager and got into trouble with her own mother. So this ma is actually the grandma of the speaker in the poem. Then what happens is in this third stanza, there's a bit of a change because the speaker in the poem, this daughter, starts to think about the impact that she's had on her mother's life when she was born. So she begins to think that she's turned her mum from being this free-spirited, feisty, independent woman into a much more kind of grounded, responsible and perhaps boring mother. And then the final stanza, we learn how the mother taught her daughter to dance the cha-cha-cha Latin dance as they walked home together from church. And this memory of her mum teaching her how to dance starts to make her daughter, the speaker in the poem, wish that she could have known her mum when she was a young adult. And she longs to kind of been able to get to know her mum at that time before she was born. And it kind of introduces this kind of slightly melancholy tone, the sense that the daughter feels a little bit of guilt that she's radically transformed her mum's life. What could we say about the structure of the poem? Well, if you look closely, you'll see that there are exactly four stanzas and each one has a regular five line length, which makes each of these what we call a quintet or a quintain. I just happen to prefer the term quintet. And it's also written in blank verse, meaning there's no noticeable rhyme scheme. It feels more like conversational speech. And we do have some minor internal rhymes like lights and bites, but for the most part, it's written more like someone might speak in a conversation. And that is kind of reinforced in some degree by the enjambment which we have. So this kind of constant flow of speech. And we see lots of examples of enjambment scattered throughout the poem. And so that gives it a very conversational tone. And it makes us imagine for a moment that the daughter is perhaps looking for a photograph album with her mum. And as they're going to go through the pages, they're reflecting on the things they see in the images. And that regular ordered structure might be deliberate. It might kind of suggest the ordered nature of the photograph album itself. But it could also simply be this idea of the continuous nature of change. So we go from being young children, then we become teenagers, then young adults, and eventually older adults, and we might even become parents. So that process of life changing is continuous and it can't be stopped. 
so the enjambment perhaps helps to reinforce that idea, and so does the regular line length in each of these quintets. In addition to that, we've also got the use of some internal structural devices. So we have the repetition of the word pavement, both in the first quintet and the final quintet. And then we have the actual title of the poem, um, Before Your Mind, also appearing as the concluding few words in the final quintet. So that kind of loops back to the title. So again, all of this seems to be pointing to this idea that life is a continuous cycle of change and that our lives in a way are mirroring the growth and development of our parents. And so it's all about the kind of the natural processes of life and change. So where a poem has been given a title by the poet themselves, it's worth considering some of the ideas within it. Now, to me at least, the thing that jumps out the most in Before We Were Mine is that final word, mine. And of course, it's a possessive pronoun. And it suggests the idea that the speaker is quite a possessive and controlling character. And it might be that she's jealous of her mother's life before she was born. And perhaps even a little bit resentful of the fact that her mum used to have this really fun life before she came along. But it might simply be that this resentment is born out of the fact that she feels guilty for changing her mother's life. Let's take a look at the first quintet. So this opening line, I'm 10 years away, could simply be telling us that the photograph of her mum was taken 10 years before she was born. The other way of looking at it, um, and the more autobiographical interpretation, is that this photograph was taken when Carol Ann Duffy was 16. Remember, she moved away from Glasgow when she was six years old. And so this is, would have been taken 10 years after that move from Glasgow to Stafford. So there's two different ways of looking at it. But either way, we're looking at a photograph taken from a time when her mum was more free and carefree and independent because, of course, she was a young woman without the burden of having a, a baby to look after. We've also got some really good examples of enjambment in this opening quintet. So we've got an example here, but also an example here as well. Now, we said already when we looked at structure that this enjambment might be there to suggest the idea of the passage of time and that life is engaged in a process of continuous change. But I wonder if we look at this particular example, whether Caroline Duffy has deliberately separated the verb holding from each other because she's trying to suggest the idea that the young girls in the photograph are trying to hold on to their youth. They're trying to hold on to this moment and capture it. Because obviously when you're young, you have very little sense of your, your own mortality. You think that life is going to go on forever. You're going to be young forever and that your life is going to be full of opportunities and excitement. And so I suppose that this might be there to suggest those ideas. But of course, time marches on and there's nothing we can do to stop that. Just as the holding here continues on into the next line, so it runs over. It's suggesting that an idea of time marching on and there's no way to stop it. Now, we've also got a very interesting use of verbs in this first quintet. So we have the verb shriek. And of course, that is full of this idea of excitement. It means, of course, to scream with pleasure and joy and being thrilled. So it's, it can be used sometimes to describe you know, screaming in terror. But I think here in the context of this moment, it's very much the idea of screaming because of joy and pleasure. And of course, it conveys the idea that her mum was very young and immature at the point when this photograph was taken. But it also kind of captures that youthful excitement and joy. And the speaker is clearly enjoying imagining her mum at this particular age. The final line of the first quintet is kind of interesting too, because it's an allusion to a very famous photograph of the actress Marilyn Monroe. So it comes from a film called The Seven Year Rich, um, which is a film by Billy Wilder, directed in 1955. It starred Marilyn Monroe alongside Tom Yule. And in the kind of the picture you can see here, the character walks across a subway vent, at least I think it's a subway vent, and a gust of warm air blows her dress up and she bends over at the waist, holding her dress down to try and protect her modesty. But at the same time, kind of you know, laughing and grinning with the kind of the thrill of it and finding it very, very funny. And so it kind of reminiscent, of course, of the image we've got in the photograph here. So it suggests that her mum, like Marilyn Monroe, is this young, carefree spirit. And it also suggests that the speaker is in awe of her mother because, of course, she's comparing her to the very famous and very beautiful actress Marilyn Monroe. It implies that perhaps she thought her mum was so pretty that mum might even have been able to become a star herself. But there's also some other implications here because Marilyn Monroe had a bit of a checkered history. She was um, yeah, reputed to be a somewhat promiscuous character, someone who um, had lots of sexual relationships, with, in some cases with married men. Now, of course, some of this 
um, is rumor and hearsay. So I'm not going to get into the kind of the details of that. It's not something I'm particularly knowledgeable about. But nevertheless, that was her reputation. So we could interpret this in one of two ways, either as a kind of praise of her mum's beauty, but also possibly as a slightly darker, more sinister criticism of her mum, the implication being that mum was promiscuous too. It's worth pointing out, we have no reference to a father in this poem. So it does kind of beg the question whether, um, you know, whether the, the speaker was born out of wedlock. Um, that's assuming, of course, we don't go with the autobiographical reading of the poem, because, of course, Caroline and Duffy's parents were married. But there are different ways we can interpret this. And if you're pushing for those higher bands, then, of course, you want to try and offer a number of interpretations to, to show your kind of critical thinking and the range of ideas that you have. There's also some interesting things going on with the grammar here as well. If you look, we've got a minor sentence, so there's no verb or complement here. It's just Marilyn all on its own. And then we have the full stop just after it, and we have this full stop um, just before it. So that creates a cesura, so kind of a pause. And I think the grammar here is designed to make us emphasise that word when we read it. And there's a couple of possibilities for this. Uh, on the one hand, it kind of suggests the idea that it's quite contemplative. It's like the speaker in the poem is looking at this photograph of her mother and thinking, wow, Marilyn, as if she's thinking, you are as beautiful as her. You could have been a star too. So it suggests the speaker in the poem is awestruck by just how beautiful her mum was at that age, because that grammar forces us to stop and pause to contemplate just how pretty she was. Of course, there is another way of looking at it. It may be that that dramatic pause created by the caesura is there to make us think about the deeper implications of the name Marilyn and not see Marilyn Monroe. So it might be read as your polka dot dress blows around your legs, Marilyn, as if she's very beautiful. Or it could be read your polka dot dress blows around your legs, Marilyn. So it might be a more critical reference, the idea that the speaker is poking fun at her mum's naivety, her mum's promiscuity at that age, her mum's bad behaviour. Or it might be it's simply there to make us think about how pretty and how beautiful her mum must have been in that photo. But again, try and offer both interpretations in the exam if, so that you can push for those higher bands and show a range of ideas. Let's have a look at the second quintet. So it opens with this short declarative sentence, I'm not here yet, which is interesting because it points to the very possessive nature of the speaker in the poem. So it's got a very possessive tone. And it's as if the daughter in the poem, the speaker, can't imagine um, a world before she came along. It's as if she can't imagine that her mum had this life, that she had all these friends and did all these exciting and fun things before she came into the world. We've also got some really lovely use of personification in this um, stanza. So we have the ballroom of the thousand eyes, which is personifying the disco ball, this kind of glitter ball that hangs in nightclubs and dance halls and reflects the, uh, the lights of the dance room. And of course, it also implies the idea of, if you like, the male dancers in the room all looking at her perhaps even the other women as well all looking at her because she was so pretty um so it does convey this idea that her mum must have been very beautiful and desirable as a young woman but these sexual connotations are interesting too because yes on the one hand it's quite positive this is just very pretty very desirable both as a young carefree spirit but also physically desirable but if we go back to that reference to marilyn monroe and the sexual connotations that come through with marilyn monroe's name this image here starts to take on an interesting um, idea that it might also be critical too, that she's kind of dressed up to go out and impress men in the room and perhaps attracting the wrong kind of attention. So you've got two different possible ways of looking at it, either the very positive idea that she's very pretty and everyone looks at her, or perhaps that she's playing to the crowd and trying to get the attention of, of people, and particularly the attention of men. We've got some lovely use of adjectives as well. So we have the adjective fizzy, which is really nice because it conveys this idea of energy and frivolity and happiness. It's a very fun word. And so it suggests that mum used to be very carefree and happy, full of energy. But it also has, again, other connotations. If you think about fizzy drinks, these kind of carbonated drinks like Coca-Cola and what have you, fizzy things tend to be full of sugar and empty of calories. So they have no real substance to them. And in fact, they can actually be quite harmful to you. So again, this might be something designed to be critical of a mum, perhaps suggesting that mum's fizziness meant that she was a very silly girl who would sometimes get herself into trouble. We have this lovely phrase, movie tomorrow. So movie is normally a noun, but the way it's modifying the noun tomorrow makes movie function more like an adjective. So this is what we call an adjective or phrase. And it's got a really nice quality about it because movie have the, obviously the connotations of Hollywood, 
And so it suggests the ideas of optimism and aspirations and hope, perhaps a hope to become a star. And so it suggests this idea that Mum was very kind of hopeful about the future. But again, it could also be critical in tone, suggesting that Mum was really naive, thinking that she might become a Hollywood star herself, even though she's living in this really deprived, really run down part of Glasgow. I knew you would dance like that. But it's this kind of longing, wistful tone. It suggests that the speaker is struggling really to imagine her mum as a young woman and she's picturing her and thinking, yeah, I, I knew you would dance like that. So it suggests that she's longing to have known her mum at that age and that she wishes she could go back in time to a point before she even existed to get to know her mum almost more like a friend than as a mother. So it also has negative connotations too. So it introduces this idea that perhaps the daughter feels a degree of guilt for ending her mother's carefree days of dancing. We've got some interesting things going on here as well with this reference to your ma standing at the close. So ma is kind of like a colloquial casual term for a mother and of course this is the grandmother of the speaker in the poem or if you like the mother of the young woman that's in the photograph. And in basically what's happened is that the grandmother is waiting for her daughter to come home. She's late, she's broken the curfew and she's basically going to get hiding. So all that means is be basically spanked on the backside for basically being in trouble. And it introduces, of course, this um, other idea of the theme of change, because we have the grandmother as one generation dealing with the changing behaviour of the next generation. So it introduces this idea of the cyclical nature of women's lives. So they go from being young women to eventually becoming young adults who then perhaps go on to have their own children and then their children grow up. So it introduces a cycle of life in the poem. But it also shows us very clearly that the speaker's mum used to be quite a rebellious, carefree spirit and would cause lots of trouble for her own mother. And that, of course, ties in with the broader context. Remember, AO3 is our context ideas. Well, in the 1950s, we have the birth of the teenager and, if you like, the rebellion against parents and their values and this birth of youth culture. And it was very much marked by a kind of a rise in more rebellious and defiant attitudes. We have some lovely things going on with the grammar here to reinforce it. Again, another example of caesura. You reckon it's worth it. So now the speaker is entering into the mind of the mother, imagining what the mum must have felt at that time when she got home late. And so it reinforces this idea of the change of attitudes between the different generations, how the young adults often want things that are different to their parents. And now, of course, we've got the, the speaker in the poem trying to kind of imagine and empathise with the mother at that age. Again, reinforcing the idea that she really wants to get to know how her mum felt at that time. OK, so let's take a look at the third quintet. And this one's quite interesting because we see with this opening rhetorical question a change of tone. And it really starts to happen here with the adjectives loud and possessive, which, when combined with the noun yell, are showing us that the speaker feels a degree of anger and frustration and perhaps even guilt about the impact that they had as a baby on their mum's life. So what was happening really is that the speaker is imagining that when she came along as a baby, it's radically changed her mum's life, taken away some of her mum's freedom, some of her mum's opportunities. And we realise that the speaker is quite controlling and possessive of her mum, or at least imagining that she was like this as a young child. But it could also be read in another way. And that's to imagine that this is actually the speaker using the words that the mum has said back on her um, as a result of an argument. So sometimes when we are in the heat of a moment and we're having an argument with someone, we might say something that we later regret. So it could be that the mum's been arguing with the daughter and she's turned around and said something along the lines of, oh, life used to be so much easier before you came along. So it could be something along those lines that the speaker is kind of angry and bitter at the mum and is kind of flipping those words round against her. Or, as we've said before, it could be that she's simply imagining that as a baby she was quite possessive and controlling of the mum and was really kind of impinged on her mum's freedoms. So there's a couple of ways we could look at that. But either way, it introduces a kind of tension between the speaker and her mum. So the speaker is very aware that she's had a significant impact on her mum's life as a young woman and changed her life in ways which perhaps she feels a little bit guilty about. It also reminds us, of course, that the speaker is quite possessive and controlling of her mum. And it might also suggest this idea that the speaker can't imagine um, her mum having this life before she came along. And so she sees everything through the lens of her own perspective, her own experience. And so she finds it really difficult to imagine any kind of world in which her mum existed before she was there as part of her mum's life. And it might just simply mean then that in a way, the speaker in the poem is jealous of the fact that mum had this life before she came along. 
Now this opening question features an interesting use of an interjection at the end. And it's also operating as a kind of tag question. And a tag question, if you're not familiar with those, is simply a question that we ask at the end of a statement in order to get confirmation from the person we're talking to. So you might say something like, as an example, you're going to the party tomorrow, aren't you? So in that case, aren't you would be the tag question. So here we have the decade ahead of my loud possessive air was the best one, A. Eh? So looking for confirmation of that statement. What this does is it introduces a very accusatory and confrontational tone in the poem. So it could be, as I mentioned earlier, the idea that the mum and the daughter have had an argument and now the mum has said something in the heat of the moment along the lines of, oh, my life was so much better before you came along. And now the daughter is turning those words back against her mum because she's angry. So that accusatory confrontational tone would feed into that idea and that interpretation. But I think the more likely explanation of this is that the speaker is actually projecting that idea onto her mother. So mum hasn't actually had an argument with daughter or doesn't feel that way about her. But what's actually happening is that daughter is feeling guilty for the change that she's brought to her mum's life. And so she's imagining that her mum might have felt that life was better before she came along because she can see mum in this photograph with her friends having a really lovely, fantastic, exciting and happy time with those friends. And now she's thinking, did I change my mum's life? Did I make it less enjoyable by coming into this world? So it might be that this whole question here is really more of a projection of that guilt onto the mother. As I said before, though, wherever you can, try and bring in more than one interpretation of lines to push for those higher bands. So it doesn't really matter which of those two interpretations you think is the right one, because you can weigh up both of those in a discussion in an exam and you know, help you to get those higher marks. We've also got a really interesting use of the noun relic here as well. And a relic is something that comes from an earlier time. We would use it to describe a historical artifact. It's not a word we might use to describe something that's a little bit old, but something that's incredibly old. So this is suggesting that mum's red shoes, these things that presumably she wore when she was young and perhaps when she went out dancing with her friends, it suggests that this past that she used to have is very, very far back now in the distant past. So it reflects how much her mum's life has changed since her youth. So it introduces again the theme of change and the kind of the very stark and very dramatic scale of the change that's happened to mum's life since she had a baby. And we also have that kind of tying in with this other phrase here, this metaphor of your ghost clattering towards me over George Square. Now, there are a couple of ways we can look at that um, idea here, because of course, it's unavoidable really. When we see the word ghost, we instantly think of death. And so it perhaps suggests the possibility that mum has actually died. So this might be a daughter taking stock of her mother's possessions. So she's preparing her mum's estate for the reading of a will. So she might be going through these old photo albums, looking at mum's old possessions, looking perhaps at mum's old red shoes and thinking about her mum now that her mum has passed away. However, I don't think it is that. What I think is actually going on is that I think this metaphor is operating a much deeper level. I think it's not that the mum is dead. In fact, I think the mum is still very much alive in the poem. But what I think is passed away is, if you like, the younger version of the mum. So the ghost here is the ghost of her youthful mum the young mum in the photograph. The mother that she knows, this older woman who's responsible, mature and takes care of her, is still alive. But she's trying to imagine this other version of her mum, this young adult, this younger woman. And as far as she's concerned, that woman is dead. She doesn't know her. She can't know her because she's changed. She's gone. So metaphorically, at least, that mum is dead. She is a ghost. And of course, that ties in with that verb clattering. So your ghost clatters towards me. So the clattering of the dance shoes. And perhaps what that's doing is suggesting that the mum no longer goes out dancing. She no longer goes out with her friends um, because she's now mature. She's now got responsibilities to take care of a baby, to take care of her daughter. So all those ideas suggest that this ghost is a metaphorical one. No matter how you look at it, it does introduce the kind of this idea of mourning for the past and mourning for something that's been lost, that's gone away. So it's not just about the change that happens to our lives over time, but also perhaps mourning for what's gone, mourning for that change at some level. We also have a lovely phrase here, clear ascent, which is introducing this idea of synesthesia. Now, synesthesia, if you're not familiar with it, is simply uh, the idea that you describe one sensory experience using the language of an entirely different set of senses. So here we have clarity, so the idea of something being easy to see, so the language of sight, being described through the language of smell, an entirely different sense. And that's what synesthesia is all about. 
But it also introduces a very paradoxical oxymoronic quality because for something to be clear, it needs to be tangible, something we can either see clearly or touch with our hands. And of course, scent is really invisible. It could be it's a reference to the mother's perfume that she may have worn when she was a younger woman. But it's also interesting because it introduces this idea of something being very temporary because perfume is short lived. You might wear it for a day, for a few hours, and eventually, of course, it evaporates, it disappears. And it so introduces this idea that youth itself is very temporary, very short lived. So it vanishes just like the scent. So again, it ties in with this idea that the speaker in the poem is imagining how her mum's youth and her mum's life as a young woman has, if you like, dissipated. It's evaporated over time, leaving the speaker in the poem with this older, more mature, perhaps more sensible and grounded version of a mother, where the speaker would actually much prefer to be able to get to know her mum as that young woman who seems to be kind of lost in the past as this kind of metaphorical ghost. We also have a very interesting rhetorical question used at the end of this quintet. So it introduces quite an interesting idea that the mum in the poem is a very sexually promiscuous character. And that's quite critical, quite negative, unless you think about the wider context of the 1950s. You've got this change in culture with the birth of the teenager, and it was quite common for teenagers to have more relationships, have boyfriends, girlfriends much more freely, have sex much more freely. And that kind of introduces this kind of radical change, if you like, from their parents' generation. So we can either read this rhetorical question as an accusatory challenge about her mother's sexual promiscuity, or we can simply read this as a contextual reference to the changing values at the time, that because mum was growing up through the 1950s and onwards, that kind of attitudes had changed, and so it was much less of a stigma to have boyfriends and perhaps have love bites on your neck. Let's have a look at the final quintet. So this opens with a very interesting kind of repetition. So we have cha-cha-cha, which is a reference to the Latin dance. But this kind of repetition is something called epizoixis. And epizoixis just means the repetition of the same word several times. So this is the kind of terminology we want to try and encourage you to use in the exam. Because, of course, if you find yourself in that unenviable position where an examiner is deciding whether to put you in one band or the next one up, it's things like this that can give them every reason to kind of err on the side of positivity and put you in the higher band. So learning terms like epizoixis is also going to benefit you. So this references the Latin partner dance um, that was becoming very popular across the world during the 1950s and beyond. And of course, it requires very close contact between the two dancers. So the man and the woman get very, very close together. And so it would be considered a very kind of sexually provocative and very risque dance particularly for something like the 1950s. You know, I can imagine that the ma in the poem, the grandma of the speaker, would not have been very happy about her daughter dancing the cha-cha-cha. So this, again, is kind of tied into the idea of the changing values in society during the 1950s. And of course, the exclamation here, this exclamative at the very end, suggests that the speaker, at least, is kind of reveling in the idea of a mum dancing this dance. And interestingly, we get something happening here with the structure too, because if you look, we've got this reference to the Catholic Mass at the end. So the now Mass is simply referring to the Roman Catholic religious service. So what would happen is that the mum would teach her daughter how to dance the cha-cha-cha as they walked home from church. So that creates a very interesting juxtaposition. So we have, on the one hand, the kind of the youth culture of the cha-cha-cha contrasted against the more mature, more traditional, more conservative idea of religious lifestyles, the kind of the lifestyles of the parents. So that creates a contrast between teenage culture and, if you like, traditional culture. But it also suggests that the mother has now settled down and is raising her daughter just as she was raised in this kind of Roman Catholic tradition and that the days of the cha-cha-cha are, in a way, now behind her. But by teaching her daughter the dance steps on the way home from church, it's kind of interesting because it's making her daughter long to get to know that earlier version of her mother, the one that would enjoy the cha-cha-cha as a young woman. We also have some very interesting alliteration here in the poem too, with the phrase stamping stars. So what that suggests is that the mum would really throw herself into the cha-cha-cha and dance it with great physical energy and vigour. And that, of course, was something that delighted her daughter as they walked home from church. And of course, the rhythmic quality of that alliteration also implies that her mum was a very skillful dancer. It creates a kind of sense of poise and grace. So again, it's suggesting the idea of the daughter admiring her mother and admiring her dance skills. But the verb stamping is very interesting 
because this kind of gesture, this kind of movement is something that people do normally when they're very stressed or frustrated. So perhaps it's also suggesting this idea that had she not had a daughter, had she not gone on and had this baby, she might one day have actually been able to become a star herself. But again, it could simply be that the speaker is projecting that frustration onto her mother because she feels guilty because, of course, she was the one that changed her mum's life and had this significant impact on her and in a way kind of ended that youthful opportunity that her mum had before she came along. We also have a very interesting use of the adjective wrong in the phrase the wrong pavement. So this might mean that the speaker feels that her mum was in the wrong place, that she shouldn't have been living that very ordinary, very kind of routine, very mundane life, that she should instead have been somewhere else um, being a star. And it might imply that the speaker feels that her mum could have had a much more glamorous lifestyle if she hadn't been born. Of course, wherever we see a reference to stars and a pavement, it's difficult not to imagine the very famous Hollywood Boulevard where we have the Walk of Stars. And each of these is basically a star commemorating a famous actor or someone else who's worked in the film industry or the music industry. Um, and they've had their handprint or their footprint immortalised by having it cast into the actual stonework along with their name. So it's an interesting image here because it's suggesting that perhaps if mum hadn't had a baby, if she'd remained this young, free-spirited woman, she might have gone on to pursue a career as a starlet, perhaps might have made it to Hollywood and made something of herself and ended up on a very different pavement, perhaps this one. What's particularly interesting in the poem Before You Were Mine is how the act of picturing her mother's life before she was born starts to make the speaker really wish that she could have known her mum at that age. So at the age when her mum was a young adult without any responsibilities or commitments. And we see that here in the adjective bold and the verb winking. And these kind of introduce this quality of a very cheeky, confident, outrageous character. And it suggests that her mum was quite a vivacious and quite a fun person when she was young. And that makes the speaker in the poem, the daughter, wish that she could have known her mum at that age. It also introduces the idea of envy again. So it suggests that the speaker in the poem envies her mother at that age and envies the life that she had before she was born and really wishes that she could actually get to know that version of her mum rather than the mature adult version that she's grown up with. So in addition to the epizoixis we have here at the start, we've also got a very interesting use of polysyndeton as well down here in the final line, sparkle and watts and laugh. And again, if you're not familiar with polysyndeton, it's just a kind of list where you use a series of coordinating conjunctions to join each item together. So in this case, we can see it's the conjunction and that's been used. And what that's doing is it's kind of creating this imagery of her mum as this very positive, very lively and, and pleasurable character. Again, it associates with the idea of stars. So again, tying in with the idea that mum could have really been something if she hadn't had a baby. And also it's introduced again the idea that mum was this very graceful and skillful dancer because of course a waltz is a very graceful partner dance. You can see it pictured here. And again, the positivity coming through in the, in the word laugh. Overall, what that's doing, that polysyndeton is creating the very clear idea that the speaker really admires and loves her mother. You know, she adores her. So even though she really wishes she could get to know her mum at a younger age and how she was before she had the baby, before she had her, she still clearly admires her mother nevertheless. And the poem concludes with the phrase, before you are mine, which ties in with that paradoxical idea, the paradoxical desire to know one's parent before you were born. And of course, it introduces a note of envy and sadness that she won't ever be able to see her mum at that age, you know, because you know, her entire existence is defined by the fact that she was obviously born. So she's trying desperately to picture this world without her. But of course, it is paradoxical because we can't you know, step out of our own experience, step out of our own relationships with our parents to see a different kind of world. So now we've had a chance to look at the poem in more detail, it's time to turn our attention to how we might revise for the exam. So we're looking, of course, for three key lines, roughly from the beginning, middle and end, that we can memorise so we've got plenty to talk about when the exam comes round. Now, if I was going to go for something from this first quintet, I'd probably pick the last line, your polka dot dress blows round your legs, Marilyn because we can talk about the illusion, we can talk about the kind of the imagery and how that kind of ties in with the idea of Marilyn Monroe. We can talk about the caesura and how that creates the emphasis. We can also get multiple interpretations in for this minor sentence, Marilyn. If we're going for something from the middle, probably go for something down here, like this line, I remember my hands in those high-heeled red shoes, relics, and now your ghost clatters toward me over George Square till I see you clear as scent. So, okay, this one's a much longer line to memorise, 
but it is definitely worth it because we have the lovely use of the noun relics. We've got the metaphor of ghost. We've got the synesthesia of clear ascent. Lots of things we could discuss here and particularly the idea of the speaker in the poem, if you like, in a way mourning for the loss of this younger version of a mother. In terms of a line from the end of the poem, I think I'd probably be inclined to go for the very final lines, that glamorous love last where you sparkle and waltz and laugh before you are mine. Because of course we have that lovely rhythmic quality to the language, which is helped in part by the polysyndeton, but we also have the kind of connotations of sparkle and waltz and laugh, which show us, you know, in my opinion, that there's no doubt whatsoever that the speaker in the poem adores her mother and truly loves her, even though, as we said before, there have been some perhaps uh, more negative ideas introduced elsewhere. So there are lots and lots of potential um, lines we could go for. You are, of course, welcome to pick the ones that you prefer. But if we do go for those three that I've suggested, let's just practice them for a moment. So you might want to pause the video as we go through these and test yourself to see how well you've memorized them. So let's go through them. Your polka dot dress blows round your legs. Marilyn. I remember my hands in those high heeled red shoes. Relics. And now your ghost clatters toward me over George Square till I see you clear as scent. That glamorous love lasts where you sparkle and waltz and laugh before you are mine. I, mean, I particularly like this last one because it almost sounds like the steps of a dance with that kind of rhythmic quality. So test yourself on those, see if you can remember them. And if you do decide to go with these, I would recommend that you transfer them to a flashcard at your earliest opportunity or several flashcards, in fact, and test yourself on them frequently before you get anywhere near the exam. So what are the themes of the poem? Well, we have familial love, the love between obviously the daughter and her mother, which brings in, of course, the idea of parent-child relationships that we see in several of the other poems in the collection. We have the idea of possessive relationships. So the speaker in the poem here is very possessive of her mother. So that would allow you to compare this poem to something that's not a parent-child um, poem. So you might go for something like The Farmer's Bride, where we see the speaker in that poem talking very possessively and very controllingly of the young girl he's married. So that would allow some scope there. You could also talk about changing relationships, the idea that life changes as we get older and we have to kind of come to terms with that and accept it. You could talk about the idea of memory as well and how we remember not just our own lives, but perhaps the imagined memories of the lives our parents led. So I promised to those of you who stuck through to the very end that I would share with you my top tips for the poems that compare best with Before You Were Mine. So you've got for example, Eden Rock by Charles Causley. And that works quite nicely because both in Eden Rock and in Before You Are Mine, you have a speaker, a child, presenting an imagined memory of their parents. And in both of these poems, you've also got a kind of sense of mourning. In Eden Rock, it's much more likely that the actual parents have passed away. And whereas obviously in Before You Are Mine, it's a more metaphorical idea of passing away. But nevertheless, we have a very similar kind of tonal quality in both poems. You could also use something like Follower by Seanus Heaney, because in Follower, you've got a speaker talking about a father. And so what that allows you to do then is to compare how the speakers in the poems present memories of their parent and how they reflect on them, but also how they show that they really admire their parents. You can also compare it to Mother Any Distance by Simon Armitage, which works really well with Before Your Mind, because it allows you to talk about how the speakers in the poems feel somewhat ambivalent about their mothers. So in Mother Any Distance, you've got a young um, son who's just moved out of the family home and he's reflecting on both his need for his mum's help in measuring the new home, but also this idea that he needs to be more independent and break away from his mother. And then of course, in Before Your Mind, you've got this kind of ambivalence about whether the speaker in the poem is being positive about mum, with a reference to things like Marilyn, or whether there's an element of criticism there. So again, a little bit of ambivalence in both poems. You could also talk about something like Walking Away by Cecil Day Lewis and compare how the speakers in the two poems present quite possessive love for a child or a parent. So in Walking Away, Cecil Day Lewis, this kind of the speaker in his poem, is trying to come to terms with the inevitable fact that he has to accept the need to let go of his son so his son can grow up and be his own person, although he clearly doesn't want to do that. And of course, in Before Your Mind, we have the very possessive daughter speaking quite controllingly of her mother and the memory of her mother. So that concludes things for today's session. I hope you found it useful and interesting, um, either in your study of the poem or helping you to get ready for the exam when that comes round. But otherwise, remember to stay tuned for the next one in the series. Take care and bye for now.